Good morning, good morning. Good morning. It's so great to be uh, with you all this morning. Uh, it's good to, to sing the praises of God with the people of God in the house of God this morning. So uh, we're going to open with, with a song. It's called This Is Our God. The chorus says, this is our God. This is who he is. He loves us. This is our God. This is what he does. He saves us. He bore the cross. He beat the grave. Let heaven and earth proclaim this is our God, King Jesus. Who is he? King Jesus. Who is he? Amen. Let's stand together. Oh, so it's like this. This is our God. This is who he is. He loves us. This is our God. This is what he does. He saves us. He bore the cross, beat the grave. Let heaven and earth proclaim this is our God. walls that we called sin and shame. They were like prisons that we couldn't escape. But he came and he died and he rose. Those walls are rubble now. Remember those giants we called death and grave. They were like mountains that stood in our way, but he came and he died and he rose. Those giants are dead now. Awesome. This is our God. This is who he is. He loves us. This is our God. This is what he does. took our breath away Faith so weak that we could barely pray But he heard every word every whisper Now those altars in the wilderness Tell the story Let heaven 
Hass og sinden form like lightning Hass og darkness run for cover But the miracle that I just can't get over My name is registered in heaven signs and wonders I have resurrection power still the miracle that I just can't get over my name is registered in heaven my praise belongs to you forever this is my testimony from death to life cause grace rewrote my story I'll testify by Jesus Christ the righteous. I'm justified. This is my testimony. This is my testimony. Come together, sons and daughters, bought with blood and washed in water. Son and Father, our God will finish what He started. Our God will finish what He started. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is my testimony from death to life. Cause grace rewrote my story. I'll testify by Jesus Christ the righteous. I'm justified. This is my testimony. This is my testimony. If I'm not dead, you're not done. testimony from death to life cause grace rewrote my story I'll testify by Jesus Christ the righteous I'm justified this is my testimony this is my testimony Let's take the next few moments and greet each other. Good morning, Florida Gardens. Please be seated. If you are new with us today, first let me thank you for being here. If you're watching online, thank you for watching online. Thank you for joining us in worship today. So if you're new, reach in front of you and find one of these cards, the Connect card. Fill it out. And at your convenience, as you're leaving worship this morning, we have collection boxes. And if you'll just drop that in to give us a record of your of your being here and to give us an opportunity to reach out to you and welcome you to our community. If you're not new to Florida Gardens, then 
There's other things that the Connect card can do, like an opportunity for you to share a praise report or request prayer or do a number of things on those boxes. So look at that. If you've seen it before, pick it up and look at it again. Now, Pastor David, there's something very big coming, and we're getting ready for it. Yes, we are getting ready for Operation Christmas Child. This is one of the biggest things we do to support missions, to bring the gospel around the world. In November, we'll be packing lots of boxes. Some of you have already been for months just bringing in things to put in those boxes. But what we're doing now is we're starting to focus on raising the money to ship those boxes. And, and it takes $10 to ship those box, the, a whole box of gifts that are going to go to a child um, for a Christmas gift that means so much, but also introduces the gospel to uh, a family and families all over the world. Um, and so $10 is in, incredible that um, we're able to send that for that amount of money. But we want to send 500 boxes this year, so we're trying to raise $5,000. And so we're going to start now by having a special event um, that I think will be a fun way to raise that money. Wesley, you want to tell us about that? That is a fish fry. Now, Pastor David has a vision to, to create soil for, in other words, opportunities for us to, to grow our community. And we have an opportunity not just to give, not just to, to fellowship together, but to combine all of these things in a way that, that causes our community to grow. So fellowship, missions, all of these things work together. So the fish fry, you register simply by going on the app. And if you don't know what app I'm talking about, it's the center app. And if you're not signed up for it, and my phone is not going there right now, if you're not signed up for it, uh, it, it will be Micah. I'm sorry, Pastor, help yeah. me with it. It's Daryl. Yes, Daryl's in the back right now. Daryl in the back. Daryl's been catching our fish for weeks Micah. already uh, for uh, our fish they, fry. They will be able to help you yeah. get set up on your app. <laughs> Got to have the fish. So register for the fish fry. You can do that online. You can do that on the app. And it's $20, and that will also give money to the, the Operation Christ Christmas Child so we can get ready for that. All right, and uh, Daryl and Micah will be in the back to help with Church Center to help you get registered. Um, and uh, you can pay online now or you can wait to pay at the door. Um, but we're hoping to get a good turnout, to have a good time together eating fish, um, and also raise money to support this cause. So we thank you for um, looking into that. And Wesley, would you like to pray for us as join, we get back into worship? Join with me as we pray. Father in heaven, we are so grateful for this opportunity to join together, to join together in worship. Now lead us into your presence by your Holy Spirit and, and draw near to us, Father, as we draw near to you in Jesus' name and all God's people said, stand with me.
consumed in glory his face i at last shall see it will be my joy through the ages to sing of his love for stand strong and worship you and if it puts me in the fire i'll rejoice because you're there too and i won't be formed by feelings i hold fast to what is true if the cross brings transformation then i'll be crucified with you because death is just the doorway into resurrection life and if i join you in your sufferings then i'll join you when you rise and when you return in glory with all the angels and the saints my heart will still be singing our song will be the same
Christ, be magnified in us, God. We pray that we won't bow to idols, God, that we'll hold fast and cling to you and you alone and your promises. You are steadfast. You are never changing, God. You are unchanging. You are um, good and you are glorious, God, now and forever. And we pray all this in your son's holy and precious name, the strong name of Jesus. Amen. Let's be seated. Good morning. It's good to be with you. I want to thank Bernie for leading us in worship this morning and being with us. And uh, it's always a joy to, to see you each Sunday, each week. And uh, we have been going through uh, the book of Exodus, and we are uh, getting to a key portion, uh, really, of all of not, not only the Bible, uh, that's certainly true, but, but all, of all human history, I believe, is what happens at Passover. We're going to look at uh, the actual event of Passover. We looked at the, the plagues last week, and there's one more plague, uh, of course, that occurs. And, and a lot of this has to do with spiritual warfare and a very real spiritual um, battle. So before we um, look at the text that we have this morning, I, I've picked a, a smaller section of the actual Passover text just to help us think through what this is all about. Uh, before we read that, I think there are just several things we need to think about to, to understand what we're looking at when we look at uh, the Passover uh, event. So first of all, I just mentioned that it's one of the great events in history. And when I say history, I would suspect that some of you think of history class in high school or something and you kind of tune out a little bit like who cares uh, about history. Uh, I would say that from a biblical standpoint though, history is actually very important if you know what history is. And so the very beginning of the Bible says that in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. And at that very moment, what the Bible is telling us, what God is telling us is that there is a beginning and therefore, there is a story, there is something taking place. God is moving us in a certain direction to a conclusion, and we all play a part in that story, and that story of what God is doing through the gospel, and that gospel message that winds throughout the Bible, that is history. And when you understand that history is what God is doing in his plan and the purpose he has for humanity, you understand that the world doesn't understand history. The world thinks that maybe there's just a string of random events that happen one after another, or there's just different things that happen that don't have purpose behind them, or there's no plan behind them. But what Scripture tells us is that all of these things are things God is doing to accomplish His purposes. And so there are certain moments that stand out in how God is bringing the good news, the gospel, to the conclusion He wants. And, and those are the truly important moments in history. And so if you're studying history in high school or college, uh, public university, public high school, there are certain moments that are sort of overlooked. You may not hear anything about the Passover in a whole year-long course on world history. But understanding what history truly is, the Passover is one of the biggest events ever. It is uh, what tells us that there is a God who cares about us, who is working to bring about his plan of salvation. Uh, I want to tell you, uh, Romans 1, 2, Paul talks about the gospel, and he talks about how the gospel is in the Old Testament scriptures, and he says, I am an apostle of the gospel, and he says, this is the gospel he promised beforehand through his prophets in the holy scriptures. And so Paul is saying the gospel, the good news, was promised 
Sometime in the past before Jesus' death and resurrection, through the prophets, in the Holy Scriptures, in other words, God spoke in the past in the Old Testament Scriptures. That's in many places, but probably first and foremost is the text we're looking at this morning, the Passover in which the gospel was announced. And then the same God who spoke and brought worlds and stars and people and animals into existence, he spoke the gospel and the prophets wrote it down and it was how God accomplished our salvation. And so we're going to look at one of those key texts this morning. Another thing I think we should keep in mind is uh, what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 2 verse 7. Paul says, we declare God's wisdom. And when he says we there, I think he's talking about himself, but also all of us who are part of making the gospel known, proclaiming the gospel message. We declare God's wisdom. And then he says this, he says, a mystery that has been hidden and that God destined for our glory before time began. So even before time began, God had a plan of what he was going to do to bring about salvation for his people, about ultimately where history was going to head, and it is called by Paul a mystery. At one time, for centuries, there was a mystery behind it. We didn't fully understand it. It was proclaimed. It's proclaimed in the Passover. All the elements of the gospel are in the Passover story, but but still what it really meant, what it was going to ultimately mean was somewhat hidden, somewhat not made clearly known until Jesus' death and resurrection. And so we're going to look at the Passover as laying a foundation for the gospel that we now fully understand in Jesus Christ. And so with with that in mind, let's look at our passage this morning. It's uh, Exodus chapter 12, beginning in verse 21. And there it says, Then Moses summoned all the elders of Israel and said to them, Go at once. And select the animals for your families and slaughter the Passover lamb. Take a bunch of hyssop, dip it into the blood in the basin, and put some of the blood on the top and on both sides of the doorframe. None of you shall go out of the door of your uh, your house until morning. When the Lord goes through the land to strike down the Egyptians, he will see the blood on the top and sides of the doorframe and will pass over that doorway. And he will not permit the destroyer to enter your houses and strike you down. Obey these instructions as a lasting ordinance for you and your descendants. Let's pray. Dear God, as we look at these words of Scripture, the very words of God, words that went out and accomplished all they desired to do, words that set forth the gospel in a powerful way that even leads to our own salvation. God, may we just be in awe that that you choose us to be a part of what you are doing in history of how you are calling the nations to see your glory, to fall before you, to worship you and enjoy you forever and ever. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. All right, as we begin to look at this text, let's just start off right away. Let me just say there are some strange things going on in this text. For many of us, this may be a familiar story. You've seen the movies, different movies, the Ten Commandments, or some of the more modern movies on the story of the Exodus. And so you may be familiar with the story, and familiarity maybe sometimes makes us not realize just how strange some of these things are. Uh, But we need to begin by just, let's look at the destroyer. Because verse 23 of our text says, When the Lord goes through the land to strike down the Egyptians, he will see the blood on the top and sides of the doorframe and will pass over that doorway, and he will not permit the destroyer to enter your houses and strike you down. So, first question I have is, who's actually responsible for killing the firstborn of the Egyptians in the land of Egypt? Well, the text says the Lord, the Lord God is responsible. It says that earlier uh, in chapter 12, verse 12, God says on that same night, on Passover night, I will pass through Egypt and strike down every firstborn of both people and animals. And I will bring judgment on all the gods of Egypt. I am the Lord. So God clearly says he is the one who's going to go through Egypt and he's going to put to death the firstborn of all the Egyptian households, including Pharaoh's household and even the animals. God says, I'm going to do that. But then in verse 23, it talks about the destroyer. And verse 23 puts both God and the destroyer together. 
God, first of all, says in 23, the Lord is going to go through the land to strike down the Egyptians. So there again, it repeats that the Lord God is the one who's going to kill the Egyptians. But then he says, he will not permit the destroyer to enter your houses and strike you down. So the destroyer is actually the one that goes in the houses and strikes people down. So how do we put those two things together? Well, I would say the best way we can think of this uh, in modern terms is when debates come up about uh, gun rights and Second Amendment rights and, and the, those kind of issues. And someone might bring up uh, a, a shooting, a, a horrible tragedy, and say, therefore, we need more gun control. We need more laws to, to regulate gun control. And, and there's sort of a standard response that, we, that we've heard a lot. Maybe some of you have used it. Maybe some of you don't like it. I don't know. But it's just something that we know people say then who uh, are strong supporters of gun rights. They'll say, listen, uh, guns don't kill people. People kill people. Um, and by that, we mean that, that we, we can't say that the gun is responsible for the deaths of people. We mean that it's the person who's actually using the gun. And so we're saying, yeah, there's a sense in which whenever there's a terrible crime with a gun, the person using the gun is the main person responsible, but the gun is the instrument they might use um, to carry that off. And the same thing is going on here in this text. The Lord God is the one who's the main person responsible for the deaths of the firstborn in Egypt. He is the one going through Egypt. He is the one slaying the firstborn, but he has an instrument. He has something he's using to do that, a sort of secondary cause, and that is the destroyer. So what in the world is the destroyer? Well, clearly, it is a powerful being. It is a being that brings about death. It is a being that operates under God's sovereignty, uh, there is much writing in Jewish literature, even in the time of Jesus, about the destroyer. He goes by different names, uh, depending on the source that you're looking at. One of the uh, main sources that Jewish people were all familiar with um, in Jesus' time is uh, the book of Jubilees. Jubilees calls him Mastema, and that may be a name you're not familiar with, but he goes by different names again. But Mastema is called the chief leader of all the evil spirits, of all the demonic beings, um, and Mastema is seen as the chief archangel that is in opposition to Michael, the archangel that is the protector of the nation of Israel. And Michael, you can read about also in the book of Daniel, um, and there is an opponent, a, a prince, a spiritual, powerful being that opposes Michael even in the book of Daniel. And so he pops up in different Jewish books at different times as this arch sort of angel that is opposed to Michael and God's people and it also rules over evil spirits and it's not a stretch to see how they would connect that being with the destroyer in Egypt there is an archangel there protecting the firstborn of the Israelites there is this other spiritual being that is going and killing the Egyptians under God's authority now I'm going to talk a little bit more about who this being is but let's just pause for a moment and again, recognize just how strange this whole story of the Exodus is. Again, if it's familiar to you, you might not see it as strange, but imagine with me that we're explaining to someone in our community that doesn't know much about the Bible, that hasn't heard the Passover story before, uh, that doesn't really know much at, at all about what the Bible is about, and you say, hey, let me explain to you sort of the, one of the major events in the Bible that tells us about God, okay? And, and this is the Passover story. And so here's what the Passover story is about. It'd be like if this were to happen in our day and age, we were to go around proclaiming to everyone in our neighborhood, guess what? There's a very, uh, very, uh, a very important night that's about to take place. And during the dark time tonight, God is going to walk through the neighborhood. He's just going to go up and down the streets of the neighborhood. God's going to be walking around. And by the way, he's going to have someone called the destroyer walking around with him, who is basically this kind of weird, creepy angel guy um, who's going to be going into different houses all night uh, long. Uh, this is kind of like a perverse form of Santa Claus. <laughs> like he goes into your house at night. Um, he has magical powers. He's able to get to all the houses, you know, all at once. But what he's doing is he's going to kill the firstborn. And as he's walking around with God, God's going to let him in some houses to do this. And he's going to say, no, you can't go in th those houses um, as they're going along. Okay. And if you're still with me, here's the next part. It gets even stranger. How does God determine which house he lets the destroyer go in, in which house he doesn't let the destroyer go in. 
Well, of course, you don't want the destroyer to go in your house, so here's what you need to do if you want God to keep the destroyer from your house. Go find a farm somewhere where they raise lambs, buy yourself a lamb, take him home tonight, slaughter him. I'm not going to get any more detail than that, but uh, the Bible's very clear about exactly how to slaughter the lamb. Collect all the blood. Uh, go to Publix across the street, buy some parsley. Take the parsley, dip it in the bowl of blood that you've prepared from the lamb you've slaughtered, and paint the door frames of your house with blood. And if you've got blood on the door frames of your house, then as God is walking around with the weird, creepy angel, he's going to say, no, don't go in that house. Pass over that one. All right, this is a really weird story, okay? So we have to think about what is really going on here. What does God want us to know? Because I believe that, that uh, God has ways that are higher than our ways. God is doing something in this moment that although it doesn't make sense to us culturally, uh, though we may not understand all that's going on, it is setting up the very good news of the gospel, how we have eternal life, how Jesus is going to come, how we're going to experience salvation in a very similar way, actually. And so, uh, first of all, I think that we need to think a little bit differently about Satan. Because I would say that the destroyer is Satan. That's who this angel is. I don't think there's any reason to think that it's some other different kind of angel. This is the chief angel over all the evil spirits, and he acts very similar to how he acts in other ways in Scripture. Um, and, uh, and so I think that our popular view of kind of who Satan is, like he's sort of God's the good guy and Satan is the villain and like all of our hero movies, uh, and, and there's sort of like these two powers where God's a little bit more powerful than Satan, and one day he's going to win, but they're just sort of these good guy versus bad guy fighting each other all the time. Um, that's not really the biblical picture of Satan. In the biblical picture of Satan, God alone has all authority and power. And Satan, in some sense, serves God. Now you say, wait a minute, how could Satan serve God? Isn't Satan evil? Yes, Satan is evil. First way I would try to start thinking about this is maybe think of Judas Iscariot. Judas did something very wicked. He betrayed an innocent man. And the Bible is very clear what he did was evil. But also Judas was in a sense serving Jesus. Jesus put him in a position as his disciple knowing what he would do because Jesus knew it was necessary for him to be betrayed so he could go to the cross to accomplish salvation. Satan, I think, functions in a very similar way. Satan is evil. What Satan does is evil, but God has put him in a certain position so that God can accomplish his ultimate purpose of salvation. And we see that play out in the Passover story, but we also see that play out in Jesus' death and resurrection. So another place that we see Satan pop up where he functions much the same way he does in the Exodus story is actually the book of Job. And in the book of Job, Satan appears before God and the other angels, and they're sort of in this, this throne room of God, and they have this conversation. And God says, have you considered my servant Job? He's blameless and upright. And God and Satan have an argument about Job. And Satan says, of course, He's blameless and upright. That's because you bless him. You've put a hedge of protection around him. You've blessed the work of his hands. He has all these crops. But if you take away all that he has, he will surely curse you to your face. And God says, okay, you can go and take away all that he has, but on the man himself do not lay a finger. And Satan goes out and he brings death. He kills Job's animals. He kills Job's children. Something like what we see in the Exodus story. God and Satan are sort of, they're working out this together. God's saying, all right, I'll let you do this, but I won't let you do that. And Satan is this destroying angel that goes and brings death. So what is that all about? Well, the word Satan means accuser. And what Satan is doing is he's accusing. And Revelation says Satan is the one who accuses all of God's people. And, and so he brings accusations. And what is going on is there's sort of a courtroom a trial, if you will. And let, let's just think about a human trial for a moment. There's always two main arguments in a trial. There's the prosecution that's saying this person is guilty, and there's the defense that's saying, no, this person is not guilty. And if you had a courtroom with a judge and, and there was one trial after another where different criminals or, or those who were accused of crime were brought in, and all that that person had in the courtroom was a defense attorney, and there was no prosecution, and one person after another 
was declared not guilty because the jury, they only hear the defense. All the witnesses support the defendant. All the evidence presented supports the defendant. And the, def the defense lawyer is really good. He talks, you know, about how there's no way you can prove beyond a shadow of a doubt this person is guilty. But there's no prosecution. And one person after another is declared not guilty, not guilty, not guilty. You would begin to question the integrity of that court. You would say, wait a minute, what's going on here? Are, is it really true that 100% of all of these people are, are innocent? There, it seems like there's something off here. There needs to be a prosecution. So God has a courtroom. And we talked about this last week that, that God must demonstrate his righteousness and his holiness. And that's what the, the, what's going on with the plagues and what God is doing with Pharaoh is, is he is showing that he is a holy God, a righteous God. He doesn't just forget about sin. He doesn't forget about all of the sins of the Egyptians against the Israelites and holding them in slavery and, and even killing the Israelite babies. Uh, he is a God that sees all and he punishes sin. He is a righteous, holy judge. And so he has a courtroom. And yes, he loves us too. And yes, he wants to save us. But here is the fundamental issue with the gospel, the good news of our salvation that the Bible wrestles with and tries to show how God has found an answer to that. How can God forgive us who are sinners and declare us righteous and allow us to have eternal life and yet maintain his integrity as a holy, righteous, just judge who doesn't just simply forget sin? And so it's, it's like God has to have a, a courtroom, a, a trial room. We've all heard about standing before the judgment seat of, of God. There, there's a there's, there's sense of judgment, and there's got to be a prosecutor. There's got to be someone to bring accusations. If it's going to be clear that God is righteous and holy and just, we need someone to bring accusations and then someone else to defend us. So guess who's bringing the accusations? It's Satan. He's the one who functions as in that role. God allows him to function in that role so that everyone will be clear that God is perfectly just. And that a full case has been made. This is why Satan is constantly accusing the saints. He's functioning as God's sort of hired uh, prosecuting attorney. Who's the defense attorney? It's Jesus Christ. It's Jesus who is the one who is able to answer every accusation and charge and say, I have paid for those sins in full. And so we see that whole picture going on. And what God is doing in Passover is he is explaining to us, he is showing us how he can be just, how he can pour out his wrath on sin and sinners and yet save and redeem people for himself. And so we see all the way earlier in Exodus chapter 12, God explains what the blood is all about. He says in verse 13, the blood will be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. So the blood is a sign. God calls the blood a sign. It's not that the blood itself is able to somehow make sinful people righteous, but it is a sign. What is it a sign for? Well, that's a mystery. That's why I started off earlier saying Paul is looking at passages like this and he's saying there's a mystery to this. What is the blood a sign for? Well, ultimately, it is a sign for the blood that truly brings righteousness and truly allows God's wrath to pass over us. It is a sign of the blood of Jesus Christ, of Jesus dying in our place, of Jesus paying for our sins for us. And, and, and so we see this imagery in Passover that God is coming to bring wrath and judgment because he is a holy God. God, but when there is someone who has said, I'm one of God's people, and I'm going to put my faith in this blood that's a sign for something, I don't know exactly what, but God has told me if I put this blood up here, it's a sign for something, and I'm going to trust in that, and if I trust in that, then God's wrath will pass over me, and I will be delivered from God's wrath. That is salvation. Now, you might think, well, is that really the gospel? Because I thought the gospel was all about how God loves me. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish. And, and so to think of the gospel as being the wrath of God passing over me because of Jesus standing in my place, that, that might be a, a little bit of a stretch in your mind. But let me just read right from John chapter 3. 
Because John chapter 3 says the exact same thing. We think of John 3, 16 as being the central verse in the Bible about the gospel. But if you read the whole chapter, it gives us the context of what's going on in John chapter 3. So when you get to the end of John chapter 3, John chapter 3, verse 36 says, Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life, but whoever rejects the Son will not see life, for God's wrath remains on them. That's the same picture as Passover. This is Passover language. It is saying that all of us have sinned. We've all sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And therefore, God, because he is a holy, righteous judge, his wrath, his condemnation for our sin, the rightful justice of God is aimed at us. But God loves us, and he has sent Jesus Christ to die for us to be that payment for our sin, that when we put our faith in Jesus, when we look up to the cross, it's, it's the same as the Israelites. They didn't understand what the blood was assigned for on the doorposts, but it was all pointing to Jesus. And Jesus ultimately is the one who takes away our sin. There's some verses in Hebrews that explain the Passover, Passover event and explain it in much the same way. I wanna, I wanna go through some of those because it, it bridges that gap of saying, what God was doing at Passover was to prophetically declare what ultimately would bring salvation to the human race. And by prophetically declaring it, God's word is powerful. It, it always accomplishes what it sets out to do. And so that's what set in motion how God could save his people. And so first I want to read a verse from Hebrews chapter 12, verse 23. It says, to the church of the firstborn whose names are written in heaven. I just want you to think about how the author of Hebrews thinks. He calls the church, that's us, the church, not just our church, but all churches, the church of Jesus Christ. We are the church of the firstborn. That's Passover language. We are the ones who are spared from the wrath of God and from the destroying angel that brought death. If you were to use Passover language, we're the ones who are spared ultimately in a deeper way from Satan himself uh, and through Jesus Christ. We're the church of the firstborn. Now, Hebrews writes about, in Hebrews chapter 11, remember Hebrews 11 is the chapter that talks about the faith of those who came before us and the faith of many in Old Testament times. And it keeps saying, by faith, different people did different things. And, and uh, Hebrews eleven twenty eight talks about Moses and the Passover. And here's what it says. It says, by faith, Moses kept the Passover and the application of blood so that the, the destroyer of the firstborn would not touch the firstborn of Israel. In other words, the author of Hebrews is saying what the Passover event was about was about Moses keeping Passover, following God's teaching of how to put the blood up so that the destroyer, so that Satan would be kept from being able to bring death to the firstborn of Israel, so that, that God would pass over those houses. And, and, and so we see that language in Hebrews talking about Moses, but now guess what Hebrews does again and again. Hebrews, the book of Hebrews talks about what Moses did, and in some cases others, and then it says, but what Jesus did is similar but even greater. And the book of Hebrews certainly does that with Moses in the Passover. Hebrews 11 says, Moses saved the Israelites from death from Satan in the Passover. But then look at Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14. There it says that Jesus shared in our humanity so that by his death he might break the power of him who holds the power of death, that is, the devil, and free those who all their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death. What the author of Hebrews there is doing is he's saying, look at the Passover story, and there you have the gospel laid out. In the gospel, you have Moses protecting the firstborn from Satan, bringing death. In the gospel, you have Jesus protecting his people from Satan and death. It is the real event that is the fulfillment of what happened at Passover. So let me read that again. It says, Jesus shared in our humanity so that by his death he might break the power of him, who holds the power of death, that is the devil. And in using this uh, language of Passover, the author of Hebrews is saying he clearly shares the view that was common in the first century that the destroyer is Satan, who has the power of death. Jesus, I think, says this too when he says, the thief comes to kill and steal and destroy. I have come that they may have life 
and have it to the full or have it abundantly. Excuse me a second. There is this story throughout the Bible of how Jesus is going to overcome the lies of Satan and how Satan brings accusation after accusation and Jesus will be able to be the one who says, yes, you're right about all those accusations, Satan. God created these people. He created them for his glory. And you're right, they've turned against God. But I also am fully human. And I have lived out exactly what God created human beings for. And I have died and I've paid for every sin in their place. So that you can put your faith in Jesus Christ. And in that courtroom when Satan brings those accusations that ultimately bring death and and condemnation. Jesus will be in the courtroom to say, yes, but the punishment has already been paid for. This person is now righteous. This person can be free from the wrath of God and yet God maintains his holiness and his righteousness. That is the power of God in the gospel. So as we look at these scriptures, I want us to see that connection. Moses saves the Israelites in the first Passover that was bringing literal death. Jesus saves us from ultimate eternal death. That's what John 3.16 is really saying. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him, whoever looks to him, whoever looks to the cross, whoever puts their faith in what Jesus did, just like the Israelites had their faith in the blood put on the doorpost that was a sign of what Jesus would do, whoever believes in him will not perish, will not experience the death that the destroyer brings, but will have eternal life. This morning, as we think about that plan, I I want us to think about how how incredible it is that we get to be a part of that, that we get to be a part of telling others. We don't have to go through the neighborhoods around here saying, you need to kill a lamb and put blood on your doorpost tonight. We get to go through our neighborhoods and proclaim that Jesus Christ is the once for all sacrifice and that he can make righteous those who have any amount of sin in their life, those who are under the the power of Satan and condemnation. The Bible says Satan is still at work blinding the minds of unbelievers from the truth of the gospel. But as we proclaim Jesus Christ crucified and risen from the dead, there is a power in that that will free people and that will allow more and more to be redeemed and to see how glorious God is. This morning, as we prepare to have a time of prayer, I I want to invite you. We're going to pray together in just a moment. There are going to be uh, some men gathered around uh, the sides and in the back of the sanctuary that are ready to pray with you. If there's any decision that God is leading you to make this morning, maybe it's for baptism, maybe it's to put your faith in Jesus Christ as Savior, Uh, maybe it's something else you simply need prayer for. That's your uh, invitation to join with them and pray with them and just let them know what's going on in your life so they can pray for you. And for all of us, I pray this is a time that we are committed to making the gospel of Jesus Christ known. And so we're going to have a time to pray, and then we're going to respond and sing that Christ be magnified in our life, that Christ be magnified in the lives of those God puts in our path, that we might make him known. Well, let's stand together as, as we prepare for this time of prayer. If there's any decision to, you need to make, you also can turn in those connect cards before you leave. So this is your time to respond. Let's pray uh, together. Dear God, I, I thank you for the power of your word and the power of what you've done throughout history to prepare the way that Jesus might be able to come and be our perfect sacrifice, our perfect righteousness, that you, God, may hold on undeniably and unquestionably that you are a God of righteousness and holiness and that in Jesus Christ you have an answer to every accusation that Satan brings. And God, I know there are a number of things Satan could say about me that on the one hand would be true, but God, I thank you that Jesus Christ can be my defense, that I can put my faith in him and trust in him and know that I have eternal life and forgiveness and freedom from the destroyer, freedom from condemnation, freedom from death. God, I pray that for each person here, that every person would know that freedom from slavery to sin and death. And we pray all of this in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Will you join together as we sing? Let's magnify Christ together this morning.
because you're there too. And I won't be formed by feelings. I hold fast to what is true. If the cross brings transformation, then I'll be crucified with you. Because death is just the doorway into resurrection life. And if I join you in your sufferings, then I'll join you when you rise. And when you return in glory with all the angels and the saints, my heart will still be singing my song. glad you were here to worship with us this morning. I uh, remember there'll be some help registering for the fish fry right in the back after the service, and I'll be out in the front. If you haven't gotten to meet me or you'd like to pray with me about anything, I'll be right in front. would love to talk with you. Uh, but God's blessings on you this week, and we look forward to seeing you next week.